Welcome, everyone. So our first presenter for today's Max Meetup is Mari Kimura, and she is going to discuss MUJIC, um, which stands for, well, well, which in just the description says is a motion sensor for performance. And so Mari will be discussing and demonstrating works using MUJIC, um, a motion sensor for performance that runs on Max, Ableton, or any DAW as a MIDI controller. MUJIC is now used by artists and in many universities, including Harvard, University of Toronto, and Miami, as well as the classes that Mari teaches at Juilliard and UC Irvine. And so about Mari, Mari Kimura is a violinist and composer and develop of the MUJIC sensor. She is also a professor at UC Irvine at the Juilliard School. Um, Murray has been at the forefront of violinists who are extending the technical and expressive capabilities of the instrument. So, welcome. Thank you uh, for sharing, Murray. And so I'll let you take the floor. Okay. Well, you just uh, did my first uh, one minute of uh, presentation already. Uh, <laughs> I was going to share you. I just yesterday I did a um, YouTube live event for composers now. Um, you know, introducing my own work with a motion sensor anyway. And I have a clip of two minute and a half or something. Um, I'm not gonna play all of it, but I'm just gonna, you know, illustrate where I come from uh, very quickly. So I'm just gonna share my screen and play this video and start and stop. Okay, I'm sharing the video now. And I know, I know my messy, okay. How do I do this again? Okay, all right, so I have to go to full screen. Okay, is this better? Yeah, it doesn't matter really. So here we go. While I was still a Juilliard student, I played and premiered many contemporary music for the violin and developed extended techniques such as the subharmonics. So I thought I was like one of the contemporary violin darlings of the 1990s when there weren't many of them like there are today. In the 2000s, having to raise two small children and traveling less, I also became more and more interested in composing and performing that I can do on my own at home. In 2010, I was a composer in residence at IRCOM in Paris in musical research, working very closely with the sound music movement interaction team and learned about how motion sensors could be a tool to expand musical expressions like never before. In 2013, I started a future music lab at Atlantic Music Festival every summer, working with many different instrumentalists and learn about motions in instruments. Although I compose for myself, I'm still an interpreter of other composers' works because I didn't want to become a performer composer who only performs my own work. I learned so much from the imagination and from the headspace of a composer. Most recently, such composers were Dai Fujikura, Motion Notions for Violin and Motion Sensor, just got released from Sony International and published from a recording. At UC Irvine, where I teach since 2017, I was able to develop my own user-friendly motion sensor system. A year ago, in the middle of the pandemic, I started to sell music motion sensor system for performance. My creative life now incorporates arts, research, education, and business. Music is now used not only by musicians, but actors, dancers, and even painters in many universities, including Harvard, University of Toronto, Miami, South Florida, Bowling Green, UCI, and Juilliard. My next concert in New York is on November 18th at Roulette in Brooklyn, titled Listen to the Music, M-U-G-I-C, Music with Motion Sensor. These works you're hearing. So um, let's see, I'm just going to stop there. Um, you can still hear me, right? Okay, so... Um, in the, the following video, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but um, just chronologically speaking, the first thing is called the clone barcolor. It's using still the ear comes uh, prototype from uh, uh, 19, uh, 2009 or something like that. So what is happening is that um, I'm, I record my motion and the sound together in a buffer, Mubu it was called. Um, and every time I repeat that motion, it plays back but in the speed that I'm moving. So it, it, that's why it was cloning. The, the fact was that that was the only reliable uh, cloning I could do at the time. So I just made a piece out of it. So he, he looks, uh, okay, this is a sec. Um, 
Oh, it's, it's or some previews from the concert. Yeah, so I hope you enjoy. Time. Stop scratching. <laughs> recorded that and then I'm not playing I go on the on the lower string it knows I went to the lower string so I'm counting with the counter object and oh, okay she played the you know on the G string again one two three four five six and when it gets to eight it transposes I you know using a, a gizmo to uh, transpose that that loop uh, down and down and down so that way I had the control over what I'm doing <laughs> and I know when the next uh, uh, harmony change is coming. So um, yeah, it was pretty reliable. I'm just gonna, um, so it goes like, it's on the, it's, it is on the uh, YouTube. So if you search it. So next one, um, this is this I made in Earcom. And this one, I had this sort of a, you know, Thing that I wanted to change my past. I have so, so many regrets in life. So wouldn't it be nice if I can change the past to change my past, right? You know, I behave badly in that relationship or that relationship. If I had, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So um, I'm, you know, what the canon is, right? So you play something and, you know, follows along like that. However, in this one, um, I play my first you know, verse and it just, you know, playing uh, with a delay, right? And, and instead of playing with my uh, delay, um, I change the speed of that second voice with the way I'm playing. So um, that's why it's an elastic canon. Um, anyway, so um, at Earcom, they were telling me, this is before the days of the groove, Tilda became so versatile. So I was using something called Super VP um, Ring, or I forgot, uh, Super VP Scrub or something like that. Anyway, it's like a you know scrubbing um, uh, function. So here it goes. This was a live at Stanford. So I'm showing the computer screen, and I need to see what's happening. I will see you know, the bar goes. It goes like that. Okay, so um, this was very fun for me because I got to change my past. You know, I <laughs> it didn't sound like the one that I just placed. I, I was able to correct my horrible past. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, one thing, and then the most uh, one of the recent one is this one. Oops, it's called Raspy Waving, and that one uh, I don't have any a patch to show except now I'm using my own product, the music, and it's much more. Um, versatile and easy to use. Okay, so I go there, and I'm collaborating with a um, video artist named Lubo Borisov. I did this at nine um, this past June. Um, the video and the sound is not interacting. I'm just playing along with the video. And it's all uh, live, so there's no, you know, recording material.
anyway, so this is also on YouTube. I'm not going to play the whole thing. So the premise was that um, um, when I make a unnatural movement, it affects, uh, disturbs the sound. And, you know, that was the whole uh, thing about the climate change, I guess. So that was that. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And uh, let's see. So as, uh, yeah, I was saying that the Harvard and all that right now, I'm working for um, their Harvard New Music Ensemble with Claire Chase, the flutist, and they bought like 12 of them. So the piece is about um, 12 motion sensors and their musicians, and it's, it's pretty, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's a little complicated. But anyway, so um, let's see. Oh, uh, I forgot to show one more thing, two more things. I'm going back to, and already, um, okay, you know what? Screen share. Yeah, so another thing I did was uh, I'm working with um, a percussion professor at the uh, University of Toronto um, called Ayun Huang. And um, she, this is a symbol, um, no sound uh, processing. It's just manipulating her uh, 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 samples that she sends me. But she's wearing the motion sensor, music sensor. Anyway, so that piece is uh, premiering also in November, and uh, you know, she uses the bow, and uh, music can detect the direction of the bow, so when it, she goes up, the sound goes down and stuff like that. So anyway, so that's that. And the most recently, uh, last uh, month in uh, um, Denmark, I wrote for a laptop ensemble. Now they don't call themselves laptop ensemble because they do other things. And I got really tired of people on, on, a, on the computer. So I wanted something that they can actually do. So first, you know, I thought maybe, maybe Frisbee, maybe Frisbee is a good idea. Um, Anyway, but I'll show you uh, in a second, but I ended up with um, a dog chew toy. This is, a, this is Clover's chew, chew toy. It's not Clover's. She thinks it's hers, but it's not. Anyway, so um, I'll just show you. So this was in um, um, uh, Denmark. And then, um, So that's, that's the music sensor mounted inside the dog too. So. so it's detecting the motion, like energy. So if it, when it moves, it turns on basically. interesting that um, uh, people move in a different way. Oops. People move in a different way when they're uh, given different sounds. Okay, so this one. Detecting sort of a, a sharp movement, of the movement. Okay. 
so that's that. Um, anyway, so I was saying that about the frisbee. So this is, I thought I was gonna do a frisbee. Oh my God. So this was in the summer, I, I was doing a, a, my a summer festival. And, you know, I thought the frisbee would be a good idea, right? So this is uh, just connected to make note and note out. Oh my God, this was just so funny. Uh, oh, can I not start? Oh, here. Okay. Can you hear this? Yes. <laughs> so, so I thought this was a, a good idea, except that then I thought to myself, well, it's in, in, in the auditorium uh, in, in, in Oracle's Denmark. And how if it hit people or the light fixture or something, if you, you know, miss, you know, miss it and they're going to kill me. So um, I had to be something that's safe, you know, safe for uh, people <laughs> and a hand and all that. So I decided, uh, first I put in the children's old uh, plush toy, you know, like a, you know, angry orange or whatever that was. And then, you know, I was tossing them around in New York and saying, working great, except um, it has a lithium battery in it. So it started to heat too much. You know, it was the insulation. insulation. So it was not safe. So I had to be, um, so, you know, right now I, I have it right here. So it's mounted, the sensor is mounted right here. And this is, you know, transparent and I can access to charge it and turn it on. And this is perfect. Except that when I was testing, uh, sometimes the sound happens by itself and she had, my dog has walked away with it. So it's like, where are you going? That's my instrument. So that was that. So, um, so the, it works also with the, uh, um, Okay, uh, so music this is, is working logic. with logic or any DAW. Not making any sound. Thank you, Tira. Yeah, yeah, this is my PhD student. <laughs> so I, I just assigned my um, the pitch roll and yaw, right? So the pitch movement to um, the volume to show you works. So that's that. And in fact, I have it right here connected to a USB mode uh, right now because it, I cannot. Um, can you see this, Max? Okay. So um, that uh, dog chew toy piece was this. I'm just showing you. Um, and uh, I have a um, LED. Okay, so this is sort of the connect patch. It has um, some JS files in it, and, which I did not write. I had somebody write for me. And uh, um, it just shows uh, the orientation. And this fat three bars that you have here, uh, shows, uh, this is very important because I need to reset the orientation. Um, I learned it in a really hard way where a student um, had a, you know, performance rehearsal in the afternoon and the evening it didn't work because she was uh, tracking the yaw left to right. And that changes because earth has, earth has turned. <laughs> so this uh, is called the Cretonian to Euler conversion where, um, you know, I'm gonna say that's north, you know, whether you like it or not and wham. So right now I already uh, reset the orientation, but let's see, I'm just gonna turn it the other way. And if that's the north or whatever you want it to be, I just click, you know, and now that's the north, right? So, but anyway, right now I'm just gonna say, you guys are the north. So I'm just say reset orientation and orient. So um, what you just heard, I'm just gonna see if this works. Okay, so uh, the first one, uh, the the girl who uh, started, so that one, see? So this is programmed so that when I don't move, uh, it's sensing the steadiness or there, there's no energy. So it doesn't make any noise, but it, as soon as I move, and it, some, uh, roll or whatever is affecting the pitch or something like that. And uh, let's see that um, there's another one. This one is controlling some sa simple sample with some kind of a filtering, I think. FFB tilde, I think. And uh, so it's uh, uh, controlling. Oh yes, of course, you wanna see the inners, right? The inside, yikes. Okay, it's not gonna be pretty. Um, you know, I'm not a very clean programmer, so. Uh, see. So this is what's happening. See, so I have a speed um, detection. Anytime you 
which you know when, when it does move i have yeah that's a b so i'm just uh, controlling the um yeah the, the, you know. so next we will have dr zadeb oskan present about her work. Um, she is a sonic artist, author, and lecturer at the Department of Performing Arts Technology at the University of Michigan. And she'll be talking about their work Proprius, which is a biologically interactive musical system, ecosystem. And I will say a little less to give, <laughs> I won't read the whole bio, so I'll let um, Zainab take the floor. <laughs> Hello, everybody. All right, let me share my screen first. Yay. Can you all see it? Okay, let's do a quick sound check as well. Can you hear it? Thumbs up. You can. Okay, there you go. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Zeynep Özcan. Um, I'm a lecturer at the Department of Performing Arts Technology at the University of Michigan. I also contribute to secondary education and community education. And today I'm going to mainly focus on uh, my work, Proprius, and let's see. I'm also an electronic music composer, and today I'm going to try to explain my uh, interest in creative ecosystems, biologically inspired musical creativity or interactive systems in general. And um, I prepared this presentation around my work Proprius. Uh, and I talk about Proprius, which I have on and off, like will they want that kind of relationship since 2015. And finally, I decided to, you know, close up the program this year. And it's evolved something else called disseminate and uh, I'll tell you why I decided to make such a system and throughout the presentation I mainly focus on the creative decisions made in the conception of the work and I also talk about how the system evolved in years and what I am planning to do it with now and um, there are things that I like and dislike about the system in general but I'm kind of happy overall that I worked it in a long time because I kind of see it as an extension uh, of my perspective on creative coding and electronic music composition in general. Um, yeah, okay, let's begin. So Proprius is simply, for me, composes electronic music. And the idea was behind Proprius is basically composing electronic music. And uh, like around 2015, I have realized as a composer, my ideas about sound in the compositional space, let's say, imagine like a smallish, okay, Sorry, let's turn on the uh, timer though. All right. And I started to think about the sound as if they have some kind of decision making or as if they have some kind of story behind them. And I don't know, I make, I started to make creative decisions, let's say changing the reverb. I don't know, changing the frequency if I'm synthesizing something in max. You know, I kind of like the idea of thinking them as if they're living entities. And it ended up for me to finally decided to build an ecosystem that can actually compose sounds so I can sonify the ecosystem in general. So it's an Proprius is an autonomous interactive sound environment where the sonification of animal behavior within that ec uh, ecological simulation is used to create an interactive augmented reality music composition. Yeah, it's an algorithmic composition presented in the form of augmented reality, but today I'm going to skip the AR implementation with Kinect and ICSD and Bisonic externals for Macs and I can specialization software spec, but if you have questions about it, let me know, but I skip that part with the new system. I'm not using Kinect anymore. So I built the system in processing uh, and at first I did not think about anything about sonification or anything about the sound. I mainly focused on creating some kind of animated ecosystem um, and this you you see five different scenes this is related to the musical you know framework of the work which i will talk about soon but as you can see i took different screenshots of the processing 
And so in here, for example, in this implementation processing, at least the artificial ecosystem has a bunch of organisms and they have behaviors, they have different attributes. And also I used a simple food chain and energy pyramids, and I'm sure you're kind of familiar with how it works. We have producers at the bottom and then we have like primary, we have producers, they just get the energy from the sun and what was the herbivores eat the uh, plants and omnivores eat uh, herbivores and the plants and carnivores are the kind of like the apex, apex predators in the system and they just eat <laughs> omnivores and they're not run away from anyone. And uh, I basically read a bunch of biology books and try to find musical con con you know, musical like relations. So for, for example, if I read a sentence that resonates with me musically, I decided, ah, okay, I think I'm going to apply that behavior because, because it kind of sounds like musical. And I think, for example, mimicry behavior, I thought it's, oh, it's very musical because, you know, the, how the blue jay try to act like a hawk because it, it just kind of tries to imitate the frequency and the loudness level of the hawk. So, you know, I thought, oh, it would be nice if I, if a bird in my system had that kind of behavior where I copy the frequency of the cat or even the envelope or maybe that kind, if I had doing something with the, yeah, FM, because I'm using FM for the birds. So it kind of created weird sounds if you just change the regular mapping of the modulated oscillator. And yeah, so I just simply relied on food chain and on one here, we don't have anything in the system and I introduced them uh, one by one introduce the you know uh, species one by one in the system so in scene two we have plants in scene three we have plants and insects plants insects and birds in scene four and we have everyone on the scene since five so they basically you know uh, driven by their survival instincts they navigate through the space to seek food or run away from the predator and if they're not going to eat anything they kind of have that wandering behavior they slowly move their uh they have less triggering bangs in the system, or let's say they have more smooth attack or decay in their envelope so that they can have more relaxed chill sounds. And also the frequency is mapped in a way that I kind of use scaled frequency so that it can sound more melodical when they're wandering as if it's, it's more different or more chaotic when they run away from each other. All right, so. Uh, let's see. So I built the system and then I just moved on to the sonification part. Um, in the system, they have different musical abilities based on their behaviors and their based on their sonification characteristics. So we can think about these animals or let's say organisms in general as if they are different synthesizers because everything is built in max. So they are basically synthesizers like modular synthesizers even because I mean, I mapped a bunch of data to their, to anything to make different sounds, including the effects or including the main synthesis method. And for example, I used FM for the birds, like I said, because it's going to generate more rich sounds. So I thought it, I think it makes sense for the birds to use FM. Also, the sonification characteristics of the organisms are inspired by natural voices of each organism. So when you hear an insect in the system, it kind of resembles a cricket sound in the nature. And it wasn't like that before. At first I thought, oh, I'm going to go abstract and, you know, synthesize something random for each animal. And after I completed the system, even as a person that, you know, does stuff, I could not even realize which animal is which, who is eating what. So I cannot even, you know, separate what kind of behavior is happening in the system. I've become kind of chaotic and I didn't like the idea. So I decided to, you know, sonify more like, like resemblance like. So I just thought, oh, okay, I think, like I said, if they are running away from each other, maybe I can just shorten the attack, shorten the overall duration of the sound and change the waveform a little bit and changing this you know mapping the size to fundamental frequency of that species kind of created a uh, nice specialization in the system because the cats like the big cats not like a regular cat but like tigers they have the lower frequency for example because in nature they 
have the lower frequency and like the insects have higher frequencies. So I kind of created that kind of spectrum based on their size. Also, um, the most challenging part was sonifying the plants because I could not think of any sound that can represent the plants in general or the trees. You know, after experimenting with a bunch of stuff, I decided to use um, maybe if I implement some kind of hormone synthesis, they kind of can sound like as if they are humans, but not really. So it worked. I like that idea. So I implemented a hormone synthesis for the plants finally. And as you can hear, see here, energy, if they're energetic, they, I'm kind of, you know, folding the waveform so that it can sound like more glitchy instead of having more like textural sounds. Also, the uh, you know, the behaviors also change, uh, mainly affecting the, uh, you know, envelope or something random that I thought might be representative for that kind of special behavior. And all uh, right. Yep. So about the compositional strategies, again, it's mainly inspired by ecological models or anything that I think that are representative for the system. And also, as a result, it can it created different so electron and electronic musically speaking, they created textures and or gestures in the system based on their behaviors. And it worked. But uh, I thought, I mean, I tried a bunch of different scenarios, I put every, uh, you know, uh, organisms in the system first it didn't work because it was too crowded. And it wasn't musically speaking, it wasn't very well structured because it was also a research project. So I thought, yeah, it, it, I, I need to create some kind of structure in the piece as well. So I decided to build this framework and A and B kind of represents uh, an environment without any predators and B represents an environment with predators, which will trigger a bunch of, uh, let's say, briefly or pursue or flog kind of behaviors, which will create more gestures in the system. And I also, let's see, what else I need to talk, maybe dynamics. Uh, I also implemented some kind of dynamics, which is after I introduced insects, they enter the system with like higher forte fortissimo kind of dynamics and the plants kind of lower their own sounds for a while. And yeah, when the birds enter insects lower then, but they just change later on, but it, it, it created kind of like background for relationship because once insects are in the environment, you kind of realize, oh, something else is going on and which will also change the sound of the plants, you know, because um, they kind of affect each other all the time. Let me briefly play, for example, part one, this is A. So that's the environment without any predators. We also have wind like the intro it's like wind rain kind of situation let's see it's like longer more scaled things going on. okay this is the part b where we have everyone that's the cat for example kind of stuff is a bird <laughs> are the plants I'm like ooh, 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 kind of speaking so speaking organisms are the plants all right you can just check the sound cloud i created a file where i put a bunch of uh, examples but let's see i also wanted to play how i you know about the structural changes of the sounds for example this is an insect no, this is the bird. Let's see. This is like a regular bird now. Uh huh. Now it's switched to running away behavior. Because it's shorter and it's like, what, 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 what kind of thing is as if it's just running away? Let's see if we have a micro.
that's mimicry, for example, with a different scale. Yeah, see, it just sounds a little bit off, not like chirpy, chirpy bird. That's the mimicry behavior, for example. That's another mimicry. <laughs> That's the bird that was about to die. That's why it had like a kind of uh, sound. Okay, this is the structural change of insect. Okay, from wandering to running away. Just, just a different envelope. This is wandering again. Away. More energetic, but still running away. <laughs> uh, yeah. So let me show you the processing portion. For example, so, okay, let me talk about interactivity first. So at first, uh, now this in the system or not now, let's say in the past, listener was a disease agent. And the idea behind it, at first I, there you go. At first I thought I can introduce the listener as a food because it made sense. I thought, oh, I can, when they got hungry or when they, yeah, when they got hungry, they can move towards you because remember it's the AR implementation. So they literally comes towards you. I mean, you don't see them because I did, I, I did not show the visual. Uh, so you cannot see them, so they come towards you, but it didn't work out well because when everyone comes towards you, you, the environment got super loud and you cannot separate the different sounds. That's the reason behind it. I thought if I make them as a disease agent, which means you reduce their health, so you kind of separate sickness in the system. And when it happens, when they when you affect their health, they basically try to run away from you because they want to eat. Um, it's also random. Uh, I apply different, you know, health reducing. So, I mean, let's say if we intersect in the system, it's not like I'm lowering it in 10 of their health. Depends on their, uh, you know, uh, energy level, depends on their age or their health. I also, you know, implement different kind of um, reducing if conditional, because I thought if they're unhealthy or they're energetic and if they're old maybe they can just die in the system now i explained it like that it sounds a little bit weird but yeah because i just need to reduce someone in the system otherwise it's going to get so crowded so basically that's why um, i implemented that kind of disease agent thing and let's see so in here this is basically this visualization serves as an in interactive score for the piece it's basically for me to check the system. If I if someone is improprious and you know walking around, I'm right, right now controlling with my, my mouse to check what's going on. But, but when I can look at it, I can tell, oh, someone is about to die. Or of course the glitches, the kin working with Kinect just killed the system overall because it just had so many glitches. Back then I even switched. It wasn't, it was around 2016, I believe, Apple bought OpenAI library. library. Before that I was working with C++, I was using Xcode, then I had to switch processing. Again, I started with processing, switched to Xcode, then go back to processing because I could not use OpenAI libraries anymore with Connect. So anyways, yes, yeah, so this is basically a score and the audience did not see it at all. And I kind of use a, this kind of simplified um, graphics. All right, but before they enter, the environment, I explained them what's going to happen. I explained all the structures and food chain and everything. I said, you're going to, you know, spread disease in the system. So they kind of try to run away from you. And I mean, even though 
I, you know, explain things that are not going to happen or what kind the things that ha happen. Sometimes, you know, people like the sound of the plant, so they decided to stay nearer to the plant, so they did not want to hear the sound of the birds. Or some people told me they did not want the big cats to kill the um, birds. So they kind of tried to catch the big cats in the system like a game. So I thought, oh, if I could apply visuals, it would be completely different experience because like I said, it was a research project. So I thought I cannot use any visuals because it will immediately shift their attention and they were literally trying to catch the you know organisms in the system. But again, even though I did not apply any visuals, I've seen some people that are literally trying to catch certain organisms so that they don't each eat each other. <clears throat> and after the, the research part of this project ended, I decided to play with the system for a while, you know, just without using any processing, I opened the max portion and played with the different frequency levels or played with everything beyond the scaling or the mapping I've used. And I kind of started to get great sounds out of it. And I, uh, that's the interesting part for me. I kind of felt not ashamed, but as if I'm cheating the system, I did not like the idea of, you know, doing something without the organisms in the system, but I liked it. <laughs> and I recorded some parts in Ableton, I played with the sound. So I thought, oh, this is nice. And I'm not using Kinect anymore. So I thought maybe I can, you know, convert it to a performance uh, patch instead of, you know, implementing in AR with Kinect because I cannot Otherwise, I cannot, you know, perform with it. I need to be on stage, need to use Kinect, and it's so buggy anyways. So I removed the Kinect and the processing portion for a while and, you know, played a little bit with the system, and I like the results. And right now, I'm on the process of converting the whole system as a performance tool. That's why the um, max portion is super messy, because it didn't, I did not build it to, you know, reach out in the synthesizers. I basically let processing portion of the project to sonify the sounds. Now I am actually doing a bunch of stuff in the system. So I need to change the max portion. But then I decided, what if I do the opposite this time? What if I have like the processing screen open where I can literally control their lives and their behaviors? I can implement, let's see. If I like, for example, the sounds of the plants, I can have hundreds i mean it didn't go well for the cpu but let's say i have hundreds plants but no cats and then i can remove the plants and have a bunch of cats in the system uh, so yeah i uh, use the processing portion a little bit with bunch of uh, basically transparency and i still wanted to stay through with the visuals so i keep the colors but you know change them a little bit and i call it now a disseminate instead of proprius because Proprius was basically uh, about the idea of someone in the system with the Kinect, you know, getting aware of their uh, like joints because I was using Kinect and joint tracking, so it made sense back then. Now I say disseminate because I am literally planting stuff in the system and I'm controlling the synthesis portion and the visual portion as well, and the data is routed from Max to processing as well. Now, I mean, it was back and forth tracking wise. But right now, I'm also controlling the actual colors and the visuals with Max as well. So this is just a short demo that I'm going to play before I end the presentation. I basically, uh, you know, routed Max to Ableton, edit them on different tracks. Didn't I, I just had to compress it because of the because of this presentation? Some of the frequencies were so low to hear. But yeah, that's like the super raw version of this new system. Okay, I played to there you go.
Thank you so much. Um, one of the birds sounds like when I play with the system. If you're familiar with Pink Floyd's Live at Pompeii, part two of Echoes, I believe, it really, really sounds like that guitar, like the kind of guitar sound. I'm going to keep it that way. I really enjoy <laughs> that sound. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, so I'm a composer um, and a performer and a sound designer, as Melody said. And um, I've worked with Electronics and Max for probably about six years. Um, and my initial interest came from uh, wanting to explore musical instruments that were unconventional in their shape and size and interface format um, that would encourage the performers who may not be dancers to dance. <laughs> so um, I created sort of a series of instruments that were all kind of um, analog circuit based and hacky and uh, noisy and squawky and squealy. Um, ranging from like a light sensor um, that had very, very long cables so I could place the light sensors all around the room and kind of move closer and farther away from them with light bulbs and change the pitch. And then I would send all of that through like a smorgasbord of effects and max. This was like my first max piece. Um, and what I liked about it was that it was this very unpredictable, uncontrollable system. and you know, depending on the performance venue, the lighting would change um, and I would get completely different sounds out of my source signal and then Max would interpret those signals in different ways. Um, so kind of like filtering, like, okay, clicks go through this effect and if it exceeds this pitch, then maybe it's gonna go through a different effects chain. Um, kind of just exploring dividing out sounds across the frequency spectrum uh, to do different things. Um, so I kind of emulated this through a series of instruments and um, after a while kind of didn't have space to work with analog tools anymore or time and they kept breaking. <laughs> and I was also becoming really interested in like getting away from these really harsh noisy sounds that I still love, but I just wanted to like create some fully harmonic uh, like luxurious velvety sounding work. <laughs> so um, that's when I discovered the crystal singing bowls as a sort of antidote to analog circuits. Um, I don't know, do you guys know what they are? Like these. So I acquired two of those and had them for a few months and I was playing them, working on a piece with them that also used field recordings and electro reactive electronics. And um, there was a part of the piece that I asked myself to become very percussive with them and I was dropping little objects in them, um, like little magnets that would click together and make a sound and uh i don't know what else brass sticks that i had <laughs> and i got a little carried away and they both broke at the same time my two bowls <laughs> it was a very upsetting moment but um after about 24 hours of being really sad about it uh, one of my teachers said to me why don't you use the shards in a piece it's like oh my god that's so brilliant i make this kind of grainy scratching sound because they're made of crushed quartz crystal um that's you know crushed into powder and spun into a bowl Incidentally, when I bought my bowls, uh, this, the 
a woman working in a store in, in the same town in Mount Shasta selling uh, bronze Tibetan singing bowls. She said to me, those crystal bowls will never last because when you crush the quartz crystals, you crush its natural matrix and it never forms back as strong as the form it came in. I thought that was really, really profound. Um, and I also wanted to take the sort of like value judgment away. Um, like, so what if it's more fragile of a material? How can I explore that sonically? And I started to see this practice. I started to make pieces with crystal singing bowls and the broken shards and electronics um, called crushed matrices, kind of inspired by what she told me. Um, and in these pieces, I would break the bowls further <laughs> or you know sometimes i bring a suitcase full of shards but i don't break any new ones at the event um i've explored having a performer drag the shards around a room maybe i can share a screen a little bit uh share screen all right this, this isn't is what, what i'm trying, trying to show you You guys, you guys hear, hear that? that? You guys hear that? So, so this performance, performance uh, uh, if you hear the, the, the echoes of the effects, <laughs> okay, sorry, that was distracting. My patch was on, it wasn't supposed to be. Um, did a performance at Basilica Hudson with Blair Chrisman where they dragged the shards around this concrete space. It was kind of a sleep concert. It was the 24 hour drone. So this performance was at 7 a.m. after people had been listening to music all night in their sleeping bags. I'm just kind of showing this these images because it's a very um, physical piece. Here's another iteration in a Greek amphitheater at Mills College. Um, that was a performance wherein I, I had to, I actually had to break the bowls because I was moving and I wanted to ship them in a smaller package. So I thought, what a great excuse to break them down further. Um, Listen to a bit of it. This is from the performance at Basilica. So I thought maybe I would um, kind of talk to you about how, the patch that I used for that piece and how it's evolved. Somebody said trippy, yes. <laughs> um, how it's evolved. Um, I used to use Max for this piece exclusively and I started to use Live for my performance setup. Um, and, I, and I kind of adapted 
the aspects of my patch that I'm going to show you to Max for Live objects and uh, kind of created a system for creating a self sustaining drone that is also reactive to the sounds of the crystal bowls that um, also serves as accompaniment and kind of like a ecosystem of sound that I can tamper with um, or just leave running uh optionally throughout the performance as i move between this physical problem of how do i play crystal singing bowls that are being processed and um the and work on electronics in a live way at the same time it's very difficult because um here i'll show another image i have more bowls now i have nine bowls now and uh it's just ergonomically <laughs> the most challenging sound palette to activate that I've come up with. <laughs> so I'll show a little bit of a uh, more recent iteration of this piece from about a year ago, um, which actually doesn't use the shards. So I didn't count it as a crushed matrices piece, but just so you can kind of see the physical challenge of playing bulls and splitting attention with electronics. also manually changing the colors of the lights throughout this performance as a sort of way to map my way through it because it was 90 minutes and I would get totally lost. thought I would share the patch that I was using in that performance, although I'm sure it's been edited since then. <laughs> How am I on time? I feel like this is going way longer than I thought I would. <laughs> Do we have a time keep? Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about time. You're, you're okay. Still okay. So, so 
I created, I created this, this patch, patch. I'm just I'm speaking, speaking right into it. it. Can you, you hear, hear the, the map sounds? sounds? Are we good? Sound, sound check. check. Test, test. 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 Someone, Someone tell, tell me that it's working. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I created, created this to make it easy to send up to four sound sources and quickly switch between stereo and quad if I found myself in either performance situation. So there's a module here that is um, kind of pitch following right now, you can hear. And I created this to kind of mimic the um, crystal singing bowl. So it sounds like I have many, many more than I actually do. So, so as, as you, you can, can hear, hear that the pitch following isn't perfect. perfect. And, and that's, that's why, why we love it. it. Kind, of kind of just sings, sings its, its own, own melodies. melodies. Um, um, to kind of add to that, that texture, uh, I, I created, created another, another patch called Noise Bath Sound Party. Sound Party. Party. Which, which is a lot, a lot prettier, prettier in presentation mode. And, and it's, it's sort, sort of like, like a drone and swishy noise, noise machine. I was thinking of those white noise, noise machines with the knobs on them where, where you can kind of up, up the, the amount of ocean surf, surf you, want you want to hear or change the surf rate. rate or uh, uh, I think I they also have, have like a tone knob, knob which is just a little low, low pass filter. filter. So. Noise bath sound, sound party is my uh, white, white noise, noise machine, machine prototype, prototype because I actually, actually do want to build, build these. these. And actually, actually just, just in the interest, interest of time, time I'm going to bring this over to live and, and show you the evolved version of some of these modules. modules. Because, okay, can you still hear me? Now that I've switched. Yes, this is awesome. Uh, <laughs> great. So Noise Bath Sound Party in live. It's a little bit more of an evolved version of the patch, so I wanted to move over here. Plus, I don't have to hear myself speaking with latency. I'm gonna show you what it does and ask questions later. with live because I can mix it with all these kind of canned things that live already has in it, like this around the head uh, stereo panner. <laughs> um, and I also love that I can map LFOs to my Max invention. Oh, I realize you're not seeing the live screen. One second. Nobody told me that. Live screen is... Let's see my whole screen. Okay. I love using the LFOs to map to my custom instruments. Isn't that working? Uh, 
I'm having trouble demonstrating. Created other instruments to kind of sustain this environment, which are also drone instruments. And I'm sending them right now to a clean channel. These kind of use uh, delta, theta, alpha, and beta as um, categorizations for the speed of the pulsation.
So that was a little improvised demo of the kind of state of um, performativity and interacting with the crystal singing bulls. There's so much more to show and share and reintegrating the sounds, um, you know, the original envelope follower sound and the shards is still part of my language, but um, yeah, to be continued. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Uh, I, I had fun too. That no, I really, I really, I really, you know, that was that was great. I, I like how we ended with some like a lot, like a big wash of sound. It was very meditative for me. So thank you. 